Rip refuses to acknowledge the fact that he is Yosemite Sam's great, great grandson. How? When have I refused to acknowledge that? From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. It's Friday, and uh, since it's Friday, what do you think? You know, you're here, I'm here, let's talk. Why don't we? Let's talk. Uh, got an interesting show today. We had a had some clown ride into the board the other day about running, so I thought we'd discuss running we hadn't discussed running, have we? We discussed running at length before. Oh, yeah. Everybody wants to run. Uh, as far as the medical community is concerned, as far as the exercise physiology community is concerned, exercise equals running. There's nothing but running. You're going to get some exercise. You, it's understood that you'll go run. Or maybe take a nice long walk. Nice long walks. I hear a lot about those on the radio recently. There's some company selling fish oil on the radio for gigantic amounts of money. There's a pain relief so what do they want factor. Because nice long walks are what you can't do because you're in pain. And you miss those nice long walks, right? Or running. So, uh, we're going to talk about running today, but first. Why don't you tell us about your shirt first before you do oh, oh, this? the thing? I'm a member of the Waffen SS. Jesus. <laughs> this is clearly, uh, clearly this logo indicates uh, not just Nazism, but white supremacy and white nationalism. I mean, look. It has nothing to do with starting strength. Oh, no. Why would you assume it had anything to do with starting strength? I don't know why you did it. Why would you assume this was related to starting strength when it's obviously the Waffen SS and white supremacy? I mean, I ask you, what color are the letters? Huh? Got a point. Huh? You have a point. I mean, what the fuck else? You know, obviously Waffen SS. You know how much trouble it was to get into that organization? Oh, they're, they're tough men. They're tough men. They beat the fuck out of me. But I wanted in so bad because, I mean, look how cool SS is, right? Yeah, we've updated from the how lightning bolt. Look, how old were you? When I got in the Waffen SS, well, I'm 64 now. You were negative? I was, no, I was, uh, uh, this, this is. Uh, Last week? This has been, no, it's been, I've been a white supremacist for almost 50 years now oh, wow. Obviously. white supremacy Obviously. look how supreme we've been <laughs> 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 my, obviously we're supreme my white, yes my white jeans are are the supreme of supreme. oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah if i could pick if i could pick anything to be it'd be a white man right now in 2020 <laughs> wouldn't it Yes. Think of all the advantages. <laughs> God damn You can it. only say that from a position of privilege. You know yes, I, mean? I can only. The only thing I can do anything from is a position yeah, of privilege because right. some reason that I has not yet been explained to me. You know, all those years I was starving to death as the owner of a marginally. <laughs> I was starving to death under white privilege i guess i don't all i hear is privilege <laughs> privilege all i hear is privilege i just don't see any <laughs> that's all i just don't see any privilege if someone could show me what that actually meant it'd be neat but so anyway now i thought you know might as well come out as a white supremacist with the waffen ss logo on the shirt right 
nothing whatsoever to do with starting strength because that would obviously that's not true but now but now comments, comments from, from the, the heaters Billy Mimna, that's really somebody's name, says, unless that's a fake name, I fell for that once. Is this a, does Mimna, is that like from a TV show or some shit? You think that's really this guy's name? How's that possible? Some people, some people put their real names on their YouTube channels. So yeah, no shit, so they're even more stupid than everybody else? <laughs> yep. Okay. Everything about this is wrong. He's talking about learning to squat, the learning to squat video. Everything about this is wrong. Thumbless grip, wrong. Looking down, wrong. Feet too close, wrong. Butt comes up first, wrong. Elbows up, wrong. Jesus, it's like a what not to do. <laughs> oh, my God. It's just, uh, it's amazing. I would say Mickey McFarts. The real name? That's his real, uh, real name, I guess. <laughs> Not only is the reverb fake, 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 fake. right, Billy? Hear me do it. Fake, 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 fake. Rip refuses to acknowledge the fact that he is Yosemite Sam's great, great grandson. How, when have I refused to acknowledge that? Have you ever heard me refuse to acknowledge somebody comes up and says, Rip, are you in fact, or acknowledgement would be a statement. Somebody would say, Rip, you are in fact Yosemite Sam's great, great grandson, right? I never heard and, you and I would, and then I would say, no, I'm not. Yeah. Never you. You've never heard me say that. You know why you haven't heard me say that? Because nobody's ever said that to me. Till now. Here's some genius that says, relax, bubblegum man. What do you think that means? Do you think that it has something to do with pink? Oh. Maybe that's the angle. I mean, what else could it be? Yep. Here, look at this. It's the same color as the rest of you. <laughs> my mucous membranes are the same color as the rest of my body. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> LOL. You could tell Mark has no idea about diet. LOL. He's just his, H-E-S, just a man that preaches eat a lot, eat a lot. A L L O T and lift hard. <laughs> classic hater comment. Oh, yeah. Classic hater comment. Yeah. Riddled Complete misspelling. No, no punctuation. Yep. You know, very little obvious familiarity with the English language. And uh, hell, I don't even understand this last one. I don't think I'm going to read it because it's just too goddamn. Oh, this is dumb. good. Look, from the same guy. I'm looking at this right now. You're looking at Bushido Same guy, Doki. Bushido Key. Bushido Key. Bushido Key. <laughs> Bushido Key. Vertical diet. Obviously a Jap. Vertical diet a nip. is literally stir A nip, <laughs> right? A nip. <laughs> you can't say that. You're a white man. Oh, okay. Vertical from my diet white privilege. I'm... literally stir fry without the veritable oil, it seems like, anyway. He wrote veritable. Veritable, veritable <laughs> oil. Veritable. <laughs> veritable. Read the first part of that again. I was busy calling him a nip, and I didn't hear what. Vertical diet is literally stir-fry without the vegetable oil. Is it, it seems really? like anyway. Does he think that's true? Obviously, and he also thinks you're a man that preaches eat a lot and lift hard. Eat a lot. 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 Unfortunately, you can't, Rip can't see his, uh, his little profile oh, picture. Oh, man, that's great. That's great. He is... Fucking jacked. He's hey, one real month jacked. Ago, I could see it on this little bitty thumbnail here. One month ago, he's pretty jacked. Bushido Key uh, benched 135 for the first time. Man. Nice. Oh, but he's 
pressing. Oh, that's not a bench. It's that's a press. He's pressing one thirty-five. Right. He's ready to lead it. God damn, he's Chase. Chase, is, watch out. Chase is. Can you feel Chase? Can you feel this man's breath on your neck? Oh, it's not a real press. He's bending his knees. Oh, excellent. Ah, uh, Key. Okay, up your game, brother. Uh, by the way, did you know? And that move out of Japan too. Chase, uh, Chase pressed uh, three ninety. No, he didn't. Shit, yes, he really? Did. Mm-hmm. He what's said, his What's his body weight now? I, I don't know his body weight, but he he, said he didn't that, do that at two forty five. He said that um, since you uh, three ninety. Yeah, since y'all talked about um, heavy singles, he need, uh, people that want to press yeah. him, and he, he started incorporating more heavy singles. Right. And said he has yeah, you gotta, five pounds on every single time he's done it. Oh my God. I like to see him, that. That's, I'm asking him how much he weighs. Yeah, because yeah, he's got to have gained some weight. I told him he'd do 405, but I thought he'd do it at 275. Uh, he's, I think he's, he's not far from it. Yeah, 390. He's closing in on a big, big fucking press. There hadn't been an American uh, that was, you know, lighter than 300 pounds do a 400-pound press and – Probably fifty years. We'll see what he says. You know. All right. Uh, I wonder what he can clean. What he can clean? I wonder what he can clean. Has he been? He's clean, been practicing three, his clean. Yeah, yeah. Three sixty-five. I don't remember. I'd like to see him clean and press three sixty-five. He, he told me that practicing his cleans helped his deadlift. Yeah. It always does, but you can't tell people that. No, 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 no. Oh no, you can't. You can't communicate that to people. No. Uh, okay. Well, let's. All right. Anyway, and that's coming, coming from, from, from the haters. Okay. Now that that waste of time is is completed you know and i wouldn't do this if everybody didn't enjoy it so goddamn much that's the people there are people that watch this podcast that watch through comments from the haters and then turn it off but you know that's fine gets the view count up we can do what we need to do we're shameless hustlers right need to get the subscriptions up we're two hundred thousand now that's not bad for me. <laughs> I mean, you know, I guess what, what, see what, what everybody's told me is that if I would just go ahead and go on Joe Rogan's show, just do it, then that would help our subscription count. Maybe. But, uh, but I, <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. It might help him. I think it'd probably help him more than it helped me. Obviously. But, you know, look, I just I can't bring myself to do it. Don't, he just bothers me too much. What if he and, asked or, really, really nicely? Well, I'd consider it. What do you mean by asking, like, even more nicely like, than like he already a, has? Like a thoughtful letter. A thoughtful, thoughtful letter. letter. In a Hallmark card. Yeah, yeah. Flowers on it, yeah. you know. Something to think about. I'll give it some thought. Okay. So his deal I'll give was, it some thought. His deal was a hundred million dollars, or what was it? Hundred million dollars for Spotify, and then he gets on there, and then the little children that work for Spotify. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. They want to know, censor him. Yeah. They want to censor him. Yeah. Yep. So it's amazing. I don't know. What do you? I mean, what do you? What do you do with that? You know, you can't let the children run the goddamn classroom. No, they, what they need to do is fire them. They need to fire everybody that was on that letter. Yep. Everybody, they need to fire them and replace them with adults mm-hmm. who know what the fuck we're doing here. Yep. Yep. You know, I mean, they hired Rogan because his show brings eyeballs mm-hmm. and earballs, right? Yeah. And now the goddamn children 
running the goddamn middle management positions don't like what Joe Rogan says because Joe Rogan is not a pussy, right? And they demand that everybody be a pussy, so they they don't like what he says. So they demand That's the ability to edit and censor. That's really and all precious. Sorts of things. It's really uh, it is cute. It's just as cute as it can be. <laughs> the good little boys and girls at Spotify <laughs> want to teach Joe a thing or two about how to behave himself. <laughs> God damn it! Oh, it's amazing. What a bizarre year this has been. Everything that can be done illogically has been done illogically. Everything that can be done wrong has been done wrong. Every single thing without exception. Everything that can be fucked up has been fucked up. Everything from top to bottom. Every single thing. And I don't know what the <laughs> what's next. You know? What's next? Fuck, we almost Do lost they, Ron Paul. Damn near. Ron Paul damn near had a had a deathly stroke. Jesus. I think he's all right, isn't he? He's fine now. Did he have a TIA? Must have been not, not been terribly yep. serious, but must have been TIA. And uh, on the air. I, I have yeah, I, I'm not interested in Ron Paul leaving us. I've been a big fan of Ron Paul for years and year, I couldn't decades. Bring, I couldn't bring myself to watch it. Everybody kept, like, I got a bunch no, of I'm not going to see it. I don't want it in my mind. I, I value the man too much. I've sent him money for decades. He's a great man. He's the only man in American politics that that yes, is that gives an actual shit yeah. about what he's doing. The rest of them are just sociopaths, yeah. Yeah. just almost without exception. <clears throat> okay, now what did I promise we were going to talk about running? We got to talk about running. So let's get to it, shall we? Everybody wants you to run. You know that everybody wants you to run. Your dad wants you to run. Your mom, your doctor, your doctor's RN wants you to run. As a registered nurse, I think you should run. As a registered nurse, I think you should run, right? As a doctor, I advise running, right? And, uh, you know, I, I we have always been of the opinion that running is highly overrated and the reason that running is highly overrated is running doesn't make you strong it just makes you better at running but if you lift weights you can run and get strong so it doesn't seem like there's much of a decision to me so uh you know running is uh is you know i used to run hell i remember uh, you know, back in my twenties, I would run. I enjoy running. I still enjoy running. I still, I still run a little tiny bit, but that's just our little secret. Okay. I have a little workout I do about once every two weeks where I'll do five chin ups and run a hundred, hundred yards and then do five chin ups and run a hundred yards. And I'll do that for 10 reps. And it's just a little, you know, wins me, gets me out of breath a little bit. But I'm running. But I don't go off run five miles like I used to. Because it beats my feet and my legs up and stuff too bad. So uh, I think, you know, a lot of people realize as they get older, uh, like Phil Ringman, our friend Phil Ringman at the gym, uh, been a serious runner for decades. Run, run, run. And he just basically quit running about a year and a half ago and just lifting now. And he feels better, looks better, in a better mood. You know, he's not all beat up all the time and stuff. And, uh, you know, everybody that, that stops running and, and, and starts training the weights tells you the same thing. You know, we're going to read some of that. Uh, but to people who have never lifted weights before and only run, there are a lot of questions in their mind 
because of what they've heard. I mean, as a doctor, I think you should run. That's a very persuasive argument, you know. <laughs> as your registered nurse, I think you should run. That's yeah. That well, that'll change a guy's mind, won't it? But uh, practical experience is uh, a very uh, interesting thing, and. Uh, I think that you people that are running right now because you think that that's the be-all and end-all of exercise need to rethink, all right? Running gets your heart rate up, and it makes you better at running, and that's all it does. But guess what? Three sets of five squats do, too. They get your heart rate up. Now, you won't have known that until you actually do them. But this is one of these things where you're just going to have to trust me. All right. Uh, conditioning is provided by strength training. Strength train strength is not provided by conditioning training. So it's kind of one of these things where you, you know, there's a little bit, little tiny bit of analysis here that you're going to have to go through. So we got this post, and I'm going to read some of it because I thought it was interesting. I thought it was thoughtful. Uh, in fact, I mentioned on the thread that I thought that we would be doing a, a podcast about this because this comes up all the time. It really does. And, and there's so many people out there that that have not even thought about anything except running for exercise. Still, here in 2020, uh, exercise is equated with minutes performing a repetitive activity. Uh, if it's not running, it's it's uh, elliptical or rowing or stationary bike or something to this effect. It's a, a repetitive activity performed for X number of minutes. And, you know, that kind of a exercise prescription is very easy to write down. You get 20 minutes of exercise a day, three days a week, and you'll be fit as a fiddle. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pablum is what it is. It's absolutely pablum. And it's, it's time for you to, to think past that. Those of you that are watching this podcast that don't actually train with us uh, need to think about a few things here, and we're going to go through this. I started running my freshman year of high school as a result of being part of my high school's soccer team. I continued running up until I started college, at which point I continued running sporadically towards the end of my senior year of college. I did a very long run, about 20 miles, with little training as part of a fundraiser. This turned out to be a very dumb thing to do, because since then, since then, I've not been able to run more than three miles without significant pain in my ankles and knees. I've tried everything from reducing the rate of increase of the mileage to changing shoes to switching to a treadmill, and nothing seemed to work. That's because you fucked something up with the 20-mile run. You'll have to admit that a set of five deadlifts has a lot less potential to fuck things up than a 20-mile run. Think with me now, okay? A week or so ago, I stumbled on this article that you wrote, uh, which led to reading a few other articles on startingstrength.com. It wasn't long before I found your article making the case against running, which was quite eye-opening, to say the least, because you'd never heard it before, had you? You'd never heard the argument that a, a, a training program that provides multiple benefits is more efficient and effective and better for you than a training program that provides only one benefit. So over the past couple of weeks, I've started to look at things in a new light, have become aware of the fact that the soreness that I've been experiencing from sleeping on my shoulder wrong a few months ago, as well as other aches and pains I have from time to time, is probably due to my lack of strength. Well, now we're getting somewhere, aren't we? 
All that to say, at this point, I'm 95% convinced, and the only reason that percentage isn't at 100 is because I still have some unanswered questions, and they are as follows. So I thought we'd just go through these and discuss them, because they're not bad. They're just not bad. As a mechanical engineer who has done a lot of running and studied the way the foot is constructed, I could say with confidence that the human foot is an exquisite mechanical system that appears to be designed for the purpose of making it possible for people to run efficiently. Further, while, as you pointed out, lifting heavy things is one of the most natural things a person can do, isn't it also true that running is an entirely natural thing to do? After all, a runner requires even less equipment than the weightlifter. Athletes in ancient times even did it in the nude. <laughs> Without any equipment at all. How is it that you, how is it that one completely natural activity, strength training with barbell exercises, is extremely good for you, while another completely natural activity, running, can actually be detrimental to your health? with these differences becoming more stark as the activity becomes more extreme. Well, this is kind of almost a stupid question. Now, a 20-mile run is not what your feet and legs have evolved to do, is it? Uh, the bipedal posture the evolution of the bipedal postures, as far as I remember, is thought to have occurred about three million years ago. And along with the changes in foot morphology came changes in uh, pelvic and femoral anatomy that allowed uh, bipedal locomotion. Uh, if you'll look, for example, at... Uh, a gorilla's pelvis and legs, there is no angle from the acetabulum down to the knee. It's a fairly straight drop because a gorilla, while he can bipedally locomote for, you know, a few steps, is uh, really a quadruped. He's a knuckle walker, and he supports his upper body weight with his hands while he's moving. When we developed uh, a bipedal posture, we did more than become erect. We uh, developed a lordotic curve in the lumbar spine, a cephotic curve in the thoracic spine, and a lordotic curve in the cervical spine. Pelvis changed dimensions, became taller, and the angle between the acetabulum the lateral aspect of the pelvis that was the that's the, where the socket for the hip joint goes developed an angle from the greater trochanter on the femur down to the knee and it angles in now if you look at a person standing in front of you you will not see this but you have to understand how the how skeletal anatomy works you you've got an angle through the thigh. The thigh, the femur in the thigh is not vertical. It is at a, at a marked angle so that it moves from um, wider laterally to narrower, narrower medially as it comes down to the knee. And this enables the weight to be distributed evenly during a bipedal during bipedal locomotion as one foot goes in front of the other the body's mass is distributed and supported evenly not side to side but evenly in a straight line as you move forward and <clears throat> this is a big development uh, along with that comes the development of the of the double arch of the foot you've actually got two arches in your foot You've got a longitudinal arch and a transverse arch. And this allows for shock absorption and efficient transmission of the force as the foot goes from posterior to anterior and you roll off of the big toe. These things are 
important developments. And uh, they're thought to have taken place about three million years ago. Now, what did we do with a bipedal gait? Did we run 20 miles without stopping? No, we didn't. All right, the most fanciful explanation of life two and a half million years ago does not include a 20-mile run. The, the most fanciful explanation of life 50,000 years ago did not include a 20-mile run. All right. Look at it this way. If a soldier is caught behind enemy lines and he's got to run. All right. Now, keep in mind that the military still is in love with running is the primary method of getting people in shape. Right. In shape. When you're behind enemy lines, do you run 20 miles? In a combat situation, does anything ever occur except a series of sprints? Not usually, no. All right. And if you are chasing uh, an antelope across the African savanna, all right, it's two million years ago, and you're chasing an antelope to tire the antelope out so you can beat it to death with rocks and rip its guts out and, you know, drink the blood and perform rituals with the heart and all this other shit. Uh, you, you don't pace the animal at a run for 20 miles. You let the animal run, and then you follow along behind him, and you, he's laid down, he's tired. You get him up, and you make him run some more. This does not involve a 20 mile run. It may not involve any running at all. It may involve just constant walking and the human foot and the human pelvis and the human leg runs and walks with pretty sufficient efficiency to, to choose between either one is an energy management strategy, isn't it? If you've got enough food inside you to where you can push the animal harder you might run if you're actually hungry and depending on the kill to feed yourself you're going to conserve your own energy and you're not going to run you're going to walk and finally you tire the animal out you kill it and everybody has dinner right and this is really what it looked like it never looked like a 20 mile run that was developed by idiots in modern times, idiots in modern times. We don't really know if the first marathon guy actually did that. That's lost in the mists of time. 26.2 miles, the distance between whatever the fuck marathon. it was, marathon and Thermopylae. Or but whatever. Even in the story, the dude dies at the end. The, died, the dude dies at the end of the goddamn deal because, because of course he died. Because, he, because even then, <laughs> even then, even then, then it was, how dumb that was. Even then it was stupid. But he had to do it. It was suicide. Yeah, suicide. <laughs> it's not good for you. Don't do that. <laughs> for some bizarre reason, a marathon is still to this day held up as the pinnacle of athletic achievement. Yeah. Right? In the media. You know, well, the Iron Man. Well, my God, there's well, no every, better athlete in the world than the Iron Man triathlete, yeah. right? And every every office worker who starts working out, their goal is to run a half. To run a half marathon. Run a half. Thirteen point one. And then they do the half, and they're like, "Yep, mission accomplished." Mission accomplished. I'm going to go back to sitting on my ass with <laughs> yeah. snowballs for lunch, right? <laughs> so, uh, I I don't know where this came from it did not come from a careful examination of human hip leg and foot morphology it did not come from any evidence that we find in prehistory as to subsistence hunting and uh I, yeah i don't know where this idea came from that running is the most natural thing that you can do running is a perfectly natural thing that you can do and listen very carefully now okay listen very carefully i have never said that you should not run 
I have merely suggested that for a novice, running is a competitive adaptation with strength training, and that strength training is more important. And for everybody, strength training is more important than running. If you're concerned about health and physical activity and longevity and every other goddamn thing else that is a reasonable metric for your physical existence, okay? I haven't said not to run. I've just said that running should not be performed during the novice progression and that for other people, it must not take precedence over strength training unless you just like to run. Now, look, if you just like to run and you don't like to squat, well, don't squat and run. I don't care. I don't care what you do. All right? I really don't. I but but my advice is that you are going to have a lot more fun with your day if you will if you'll train for strength most of the time and occasionally run. But I'm not saying don't do it because I do it myself as I've already explained. Uh I just don't do it as the bulk of my 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 stuff that I do. And I don't think you should either. Because I think a strength training adaptation is much more valuable to you physically. All right. Anytime I encounter something that causes me to massively change my thinking like this, I'm extremely interested to hear what people who aren't convinced by the argument have to say about it. In light of that, what would you say is the best argument against the starting strength model that you're aware of, and what is your response? Furthermore, would you be willing to share something that someone critical of starting strength has written that you believe represents the best argument against it? Well, that's kind of an interesting question because I've never heard a logical argument against it. Best or not, I haven't heard a logical argument against getting stronger. Starting strength is the most straightforward way that it's in existence for you to get stronger. There's nothing that works any better. Nothing works better than adding five pounds to your squat for three sets of five, three days a week until that doesn't work anymore. And that's the essence of the movement. That's the essence of starting strength. Squat below parallel. Three days a week for three sets of five. Add five pounds to the work set every workout until that quits working. And then we'll find out what we're going to do to continue the adaptation process. But there's no, there's no more straightforward, efficient, effective way to get stronger than that. There isn't one. No, there isn't one. Okay. And... Uh, so I don't know what would constitute a, an argument against starting strength. Uh, I mean, we hear little nitpicky bullshit all the time, don't we? And what and what do we do? We yeah, it's just logically it, analyze and respond, and and it's a it's a weird question because the, the because if you're basing starting strength off of the first principles, gravity physiology, biology, you would have to argue that your, that your analysis based on those first principles is wrong, right? right? Because that's yep. all it is. It's just an application of, of first principles yes. in, in the barbell training. Yes. So you would have to argue that your analysis is wrong and nobody has done that. Nobody has done that. Nobody has told us why squatting down and standing back up Picking up something off the ground, pushing something away from you, and pushing something overhead are not the four basic human multi-joint movement patterns. Yep. All we do is load them incrementally. Right. That's all we do. You got a better you got a better approach? Let's hear it. But I hadn't heard it yet. We've been doing this for fifteen years. And we haven't heard it. And we're waiting. Maybe the haters. The haters have tried. Maybe the haters will try. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, any refutations come in the form of, of like comparing this this thing to starting strength 
this other method. There's no, there's never a refutation on the on the principles. No. So uh, uh, nowhere, nowhere. No, there's not. And it's not like there haven't been opportunities. Sure. You know, we've been doing this podcast over a year now. Uh, if you got a, if you've got, here's an open invitation to anybody that wants to refute our argument. We'll have you on the show. We'll have you on the podcast. But you better have your fucking shit together. <laughs> I'm going to tear you apart if you don't. You know, and maybe we'll just throw all of the books away once we get through this yeah. this groundbreaking podcast. But <laughs> I haven't uh, I haven't seen a reasonable argument yet. Uh, contact us if you have one. Okay. One of the arguments in favor of the healthiness of running that I've heard is the fact that there are many old people, including non-engineerians. That means ninety-year-old people. 90 years and older people uh, who run and sometimes do so for quite long distances, including marathons. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're making a different point. Not only can a person of any age improve their health by strength training, but also a person who begins strength training at the age of 10 can continue doing it until they die at 90 without concern for injury that is associated with repetitive movements. Or any of uh, the other downsides to running you described. Am I understanding that correctly? No, no, really you're not. I'm not saying that strength training is always going to be injury free. That would be a stupid thing to say. Running is not injury free. And strength training is certainly not risk free. Living is not risk free. Now, if 2020 hasn't taught us anything. It's, it's taught us, those of us that have, have stepped back from this chaos and irrationality and, and examined the actual numbers, understand that one of the things about being alive is that you can get sick. One of the things about getting sick is that some people who get sick, not many, but some people who get sick, depending on what they're sick with, will die from being sick. It's been this way probably since before the three million years ago when bipedalism arose. All right? Life is not without risk. I'm sorry, but it's not. Even if you're a good little boy and a good little girl and wear your mask Everywhere you go, you still might get sick and die. And, you know, in, in my estimation, you don't have to be a coward <laughs> while you're being alive with the possibility of getting sick. Uh, we have heretofore, as humans, accepted risks as part of our existence, right? We get sick. We get injured. Happens all the time, whether we want it to or not. And that is true of running, and it is true of strength training. All right? The argument cannot be which of the two is safer. Because any endeavor pursued with sufficient intensity by committed, dedicated people runs the risk of causing an injury. All right? And committed and dedicated people are, they're not concerned about that. They're, they're concerned about getting something done. Not about the inevitable thing that's going to happen, getting sick, getting injured, and dying. It happens to all of us. It's one of them deals. All right? The analysis must be which of the two activities produces the greater amount of benefit for the time spent doing it. And hands down, strength training beats running every single time in every analysis. One of the most fascinating things is that people are somehow under the impression that if you start 
uh, squatting, deadlifting, pressing, bench pressing during the Olympic lifts that you somehow suddenly lose the ability to put one foot in front of the other and run. I, I don't understand this. I remember a Sunday afternoon a long time ago. I was probably 27. Uh, went to the gym. I believe it was a Sunday afternoon. I was hung over. Must have been a Sunday afternoon. I was hung over as a pile of dead cockroaches. And went to the gym, squatted three sets of 10 at 405. Which for me was pretty good. And then I went out and ran six miles that same day. Can't do that now. I'm 64 now. I've got lots of accumulated injuries, that most of which didn't happen in the gym, in fact. Because I, you know, had a pretty deep drink from the fountain of life, as they say, and I've uh, done a bunch of fun stuff that was also at the same time stupid, all right? So I've been beat up pretty bad. But 405 for three sets of 10 and then run six miles? Look, take your concerns about strength training, making it impossible to run, and stick that up your ass. Okay, because that's right where it belongs. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Those of you people that say that if we start strength training people in the military, well, what if they need to run? They hadn't been running. Do you honestly think that a 23-year-old kid who takes his squat from nothing to 405 loses the ability to run? What is wrong with you? Are you that far removed from physical existence that you don't understand that there's nothing about a heavy squat that means you can't run five miles? This is the most puzzling aspect of this objection to, to especially strength training as the basis for uh, PT in the military. That, that I, I can't I can't really uh, wrap my head around uh, the level of denial that it takes to say something stupid like, well, but they hadn't been running, so they can't run. How do you get that detached? See, the, the thing is, is these people haven't squatted 405. And they don't understand. They don't understand. When you squat 405, uh, you, you probably you're running faster than you were before you were that strong. And uh, in fact, we've got some comments here that were posted on this in response to this. This question, because I had immediately jumped in and said, you know, that's a pretty good question. So we're going to talk about it on the podcast. But that didn't keep people from posting their responses. Well, Rip, and fun <clears throat> fundamentally, people start to start to ask these kind of questions, and they start to form opinions early on before they have any appreciable experience in any in either right. domain, right? So, so what I'm talking about is guys who are strength training and barely squatting 275, right. and have already formed strong opinions on what's going on with their with their strength training, you know, or not even, or, or you know, just runners who, right. uh, who don't have, like, it's different. Going from 275 to 350 to 405 is a whole different thing. Yes. You know, most guys will squat 315 with a little bit of, of most, most guys can squat 315 in six months without even – yeah. really applying themselves. And how many are going to get to 405? And how many are going to get to 500? It drops off very, very steeply, and they don't, just don't right. understand what it takes to get there. And they don't understand the actual adaptations that occur when but, you do yeah. that. They don't understand that when you get to 405, you can still run. They don't understand when you get to 495, you can actually still run. None of them will ever be at 585. Right. And you can still run at 585. 
Now, if you decide to be a competitive lifter and you want to get your squat up to seven plates at 675, then you're entering an area of specialization that most people never get to. Now, a guy that's squatting 675 or 765 or even 855, those guys may not run. Because of the level of specialization required, they don't need a competing adaptation like running interfering with their powerlifting. Those are not the people we're talking about. We're talking about the guy that wants to be healthy and strong. All right? You can be healthy and strong squatting 495 for five and still run. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can if you'll just do it because a lot of people have done it including me all right uh let's see here these are these are some thoughtful responses relapsed runner here one point that gets missed in the either or debate over lifting and running is that the interference is asymmetrical Running lots of miles interferes with strength training more than lifting weights interferes with running. Exactly our point. Exactly our point. I suspect that barbell lifts actually improve running performance for most recreational runners. My anecdotal experience as follows. At the age of 32, I ran a 323 marathon, which is a pretty damn good marathon. You know, with very skinny, uh, with no lifting on classic high mileage marathon training. After that race, I bought starting strength, stopped running, did the novice linear progression, gained 50 pounds, and continued to lift and not run until I was 37. That's five years later. During this time, I used the advanced novice and intermediate programs and practical programming. I realized that I missed running and started again, but kept lifting. At age 40... I ran a marathon in 309 at a body weight that was 30 pounds more than when I was 32 years old, eight years prior. All the time, I continued to squat, deadlift, and press one to three times a week, depending on training load. Since then, I've completed multiple 100-mile mountain ultramarathons. In those events, strength is even more important. Then the shorter events, because one of the biggest reasons for, new, for not finishing is leg musculoskeletal fatigue. Obviously, there are trade-offs. My lifts went down when I added running back in, but most of my novice gains remain. I am a faster runner at 43 and lifting than I was just running at 32. And I am way stronger. For most runners, there's no reason to not also train with weights. The low-hanging novice gains are there for the taking. And if that is all a runner ever does, those novice gains radically improve quality of life. Now, most of the other responses are just exactly like this. We talk to people over the years that of every one of them have told us exactly. I've never talked to somebody that that said that getting their squat from nothing to two and a quarter did anything but help their running. Never talked to anybody like that. All right. Now, if you are running a 209 marathon, you're a little East African guy running a 209 marathon. I'm, I'm not interested in dealing with you. That is such a specialized activity that you you know how to train for that and uh and that's fine all right but I, that's that's not the kind of people we're dealing with i'm not dealing with and and i've already told you that 800 pound squatters don't need to run at all i'm dealing with the vast majority of the human race that's somewhere in the middle all right running you can run okay you can run whether you run or not you always be able to run you need to train for strength if you want to run some, run some. But don't make 
running the emphasis because it doesn't need to be the emphasis. And if you make it the emphasis, you will bypass the strength benefits. Hi, my name is Frank, and I was a runner, cyclist, and swimmer. I've now been clean for nine months. <laughs> but I do like to sprint in the pool from time to time. I had chronically high blood pressure, 150 over 90 on a good day, as a runner. As a runner. 150 over 90. As a runner. You guys... Is my emphasis sufficient? As a registered nurse. I, I, <laughs> uh, okay. Now, my neck hurt all the time. I'm 6'2", running 20 to 30 miles a week. I weighed 173. 45 pounds later and still growing, I still have to take 320 milligram of Valsartan daily, but my blood pressure has been checked weekly for the last three months in a row at 120 over 80. My best ever on the same medication when he was running only that produced 150 over 90. Okay, this guy's got familial high, breath, high blood pressure. But it went down with the addition of strength training. My anecdotal personal opinion is that heavy cardio creates a lot of systemic inflammation in some people. I'd say that's a reasonable thing to, to conclude. All that repetitive motion just beats the piss out of a whole bunch of structures. And it damages a whole bunch of structures. And damage is repaired through the inflammatory cascade. That is just the way the body fixes things. And a in big inflammatory load like that is uh, something that puts a lot of stress on the cortisone secretion system. And uh, the adrenal cortex hormones get overworked. And this is just not good to be bathed in high levels of cortisone all the time. It's not good for you. It's catabolic. That's what cortisone is. It's a catabolic hormone. It tears tissue down so that it can be replaced with good tissue. That's the problem with chronic inflammation. Okay. Couple this with the idea that my version of strength training for legs was Bulgarian <laughs> split squats. As many reps as possible with 20-pound kettlebells. And that the rest of my lifting was inspired by a mostly fake YouTube personality whose brand ends in X. <laughs> oh, that's the P90 thing, right? No, no. Oh, no? No. It's, uh, it's he, got, he got busted using fake weights. Oh, he did? Yeah. Which oh, is that's the, amusing. Which yeah. is the highest crime on in internet videos. Yeah. Is yeah. Using fake oh, did weights. you see Andrew Cuomo? That was Chris the, Cuomo. It was the, the, it was brother, the governor. Right? No, no, it was the, the news guy. I think it was the governor. Oh, it's you think it was the it was Chris, Chris, yeah. Chris, the, with the, the broadcaster pound, with a hundred pound dumbbell over his head while he's typing. <laughs> what Here, a piece of shit! <laughs> <laughs> what a what a piece of shit that guy is. God Almighty, a hundred pound dumbbell and typing in the other. No, no, that doesn't happen. I'm sorry. All right, so uh, uh, I stayed chronically sore, injured, and for some strange reason, my bench press was always high. I wonder if he means partial or heavy. My doctor said there's a good chance I had a small TIA at the age of 35 and encouraged me to keep up with my cardio and stay away from heavy weights. Instead, I gained 45 pounds of mostly muscle and quit running. My doctor, not happy. My blood pressure, quite good. As your doctor, I advise running. That's just a little sentence they're taught in medical school. P.S. Just out of curiosity, I want to see what my 100-meter sprint was after gaining 45 pounds. I was never a speed demon, but I went from 1 minute 35 as my previous best to 123. No diving platform. Just pushing off the wall. This is in the pool, by the way, right? 
went from 135 for a 100 meter sprint to 100 to 123. And that's just pushing off the wall. Well, the only the only aquatic training in the past six months being my novice linear progression. For anyone who's ever swum, 12 seconds on 100 meters is a big deal. To do it 45 pounds heavier is unthinkable to me. I don't see many swimmers come through here because I guess they think they have to swim with loaded barbells on their back. <laughs> but hopefully this will turn up in a Google search somewhere and lead the next Michael Phelps down the right path. Probably not. Because they've all got a coach who's going to tell them otherwise. Right? Here's another one. Hello. As a former runner and a female, I'll give you my experience. I've been a runner since my mid-20s. Never super fast, but tons of endurance. I'm 58 now. I've run 14 full marathons and many more half marathons. Yet I didn't have the upper body strength to pull myself up out of the water into a boat. I started to strength train about six years ago while still trying to run marathons. I quickly realized that it was simply too much for me, so I backed off considerably with my running, but did not quit running until just recently. You can run and strength train, but there is a balance. As a woman, I did have the going to get bulky fears that most women have, but as I started to see the numbers of my lifts going up, I quit worrying about that. Anyway, currently I am about three to five pounds heavier than my running weight. I'm in the same clothing size that I was before. My body's changed, no doubt, but I love the changes and I'm even more amazed by what my body can do. I just recently deadlifted 210. I bench pressed 95 and I can back squat 145. Not shocking numbers, but for this 58 year old, 5'2, 130 pound woman, I'm pretty proud. Oh, and it's for that upper body issue I mentioned. I can now do multiple unassisted pull and chin-ups. As I said, I quit running this past six months. I'm now lifting weights three to four days a week, doing some cycling and yoga. Because you have to do yoga if you're a girl. It's just <laughs> it's part of the girl club thing for some reason. Uh, so that's a, that's another good story. That's, that's, uh, uh, typical of the things we hear people being able to do when they stop beating the piss out of themselves with low intensity, long, slow distance and start doing higher intensity strength training type stuff. It's just a more useful adaptation. More importantly, it doesn't interfere with your ability to do endurance-based stuff too, right? If there's nothing else you get out of this podcast today, I want you to understand that if you want to run, run, all right? But don't make running the keystone of your training. Running is an assistance exercise. That's the best way to think of it. It's an assistance exercise, not the primary thing that you do, okay? As a runner and a doctor. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, here we go. Two strikes against me for rip. <laughs> that's funny. Hey, you put that in there. That's funny. That's, that's good. That's, that's an amazing amount of self-awareness. <laughs> I'll speak out of defense of running for mediocre lifters and lifting for mediocre runners. First, the heart. The adaptations of the heart to running and weightlifting are essentially opposite, and the nature of these adaptations are pretty intuitive. The runner's heart has to pump more blood for a longer time. In response, the left ventricle remodels to a larger cavity, with maybe a little increase in muscle thickness. The lifter's heart really doesn't have to adapt as much, due to less time under stress. Think about your work-rest ratio. It adapts to a much higher pressure load in response to the pressure, not so much the volume load. The left ventricular muscle gets thicker and maybe the cavity grows a little. 
rowers, I figure, are somewhere in the middle of strength endurance. I've looked everywhere to try and find articles describing the difference in cardiac adaptations of rowers versus runners, but to no avail. Which is better from a cardiac standpoint between runners and lifters? If I have read or write, probably the running, but both are a damn sight better than the nothing that most people do. All right, I, I don't know how you can say that the left ventricular adaptations that come with weightlifting and strength training are not as beneficial as the left ventricular adaptations that happen with, uh, with running. You get a bigger ejection fraction, bigger ejection volume when you run. How is that relevant? Why do we care? As I've previously demonstrated, I was strong enough to do 405 for 10 and run six miles the same day. I know all, all the guys we used to train with did the same thing. We all did all of it. So here's a situation in which being a doctor is not terribly helpful because you lack an appreciation of the actual phenomenology. What actually happens is you get real strong until you get real, real, real God awful world class power lifter strong. You could still run. Right. The, the, the adaptations are not exclusive in that way. All right. And here he says now musculoskeletal in contrast to conventional wisdom, there is no link between osteoarthritis and running. Uh, okay, I'll give him that. Maybe there's not. <clears throat> I don't think that's true, but let's assume it is. All right. From there, it's all a bit of leap of faith, but I think it's a reasonable argument that running itself isn't injurious. It's been lots and lots and lots of people's experience that it is. Running itself is injurious. And he's about to make a better point. Now, runners get hurt because running badly is injurious. Or running on bad joints is injurious. The problem is that endurance adaptations are quick enough that your heart and lungs can write mileage or speed checks that your legs can't cash. Now, here is an excellent point. And we haven't made this yet in this discussion. An endurance adaptation is a short-term adaptation. Now, you know this because uh, there is this phenomena called two-a-days. When kids show up two weeks before school starts to play football for two weeks every day and get in shape, okay? And it has worked for decades and decades, you take a kid who's completely out of shape from sitting on his dead ass all summer long to in shape in two weeks because a conditioning adaptation is a rapid onset adaptation, as he mentions here. Uh, you can get in conditioning shape very, very quickly. If that is true, and it is true, then why do we need to do it all the time? We do this with people in the military quite frequently. They've got a test. They've got a, some mindless fucking two-mile run they've got to do for twice a year to maintain their military privileges at the BX, right? So they, they take the test. They run the two miles, and then they pass the numbers, and they, you know, go into the BX and eat on the public dole cheap, okay? <laughs> But you don't have to run all year to pass the test. What you need to do is run three times before the test, take the test, and stop running, and go back to your training. We do this all the time. Uh, three weeks, two weeks before the test, we'll have them run two miles. Then five more days, five days later, we'll have them run five, or have them run another two miles. Three days later, we'll run two miles, and then you go take the test, 
and you murder the test. And then you're off of your obligation for another six months, and and then uh, everything's fine. And you don't ruin your strength training. Because the running adaptation ac- accumulates very quickly. You can get to a run with just a little bit of time. And since that's the case, and since, in contrast, strength training is a chronic adaptation, a very long-term adaptation, you can make your deadlift stronger for 10 years. Since you know that, assign the appropriate amount of training time to each of these activities. You don't have to run a whole bunch to be in shape to run. It comes on quickly. Okay. So I'm glad he brought that up. Uh, When you fail a lift, it's just over. You can't lift it. You put it down. More than likely, the only injury will be to your pride. If you try and run a distance, you can't run. Your form will suffer. But you can keep going. So his contention is, is running badly produces an injury, not running. And my response to that would be, how many people don't get tired at the end of a run and run badly as a result of that. You know who doesn't get tired at the end of a run and therefore doesn't run badly? Someone who is strong enough to not be fatigued because they've been strength training. Devastating, aren't I? Don't you think that was devastating, Nick? crushing a crushing blow to this doctor's logic okay i'll be honest here the only musculoskeletal benefit to running is that it allows you to keep running it doesn't really have the carryover of lifting to other activities (laughs) (laughs) and after all he is a doctor if you'd rather bike or stairmaster a couple of times a week for 20 minutes that's fine i think you should because i think it's good for you And you're never going to be Kirk Karwoski. I run because I like to run. And I lift because I'm never going to be Meb Keflezi. Obviously a marathon guy from Kenya. Right? Uh, I apologize if this is disjointed. No, no, no. no. This is a a good post. I appreciate you doing it. It allows us the opportunity to make some valuable points. Uh, Once again. Here's the fundamental point of this thing. If you've got two activities you can engage in, running and strength training, which one pays the bills? Strength training pays the bills. Uh, Strength training makes you stronger and a better runner. Running only makes you a marginally better runner, but you'll be better if you strength train in addition to your running that if you then if you only run now i understand that those of you runners and you recreational cyclists that just get out on the road and and ride 50 miles on the weekend and you know just you you guys are not really thinking about this like athletes okay an athlete trains for his sport he does whatever is necessary to prepare physiologically to be better at what he does. Strength training prepares you to be better physiologically for everything you do. Everything you do. Running prepares you to be better physiologically for one thing and one thing only, and that's running. Now, this is terribly critical that you understand this. If you think that running is necessary for the cardiovascular benefits of exercise, you have never done Five sets of five at 405. You don't know because you haven't had the experience. You don't understand that that is cardio. Okay? Because you've never been under the bar and you don't know. You don't understand. Even as a registered nurse, this may elude you. All right? Even as a doctor, you may not understand this if you've never yourself taken 405 out of the rack for the fifth set of five and finished the fifth rep of that set and then racked it and checked your heart rate. You don't understand. Try it sometime. 
just go through the process of the novice linear progression and get strong and understand what the hell is happening to you while you're doing this because it's more than you think it is okay running has been held up as the be all and end all the sine qua non am i pronouncing that correctly it's latin i think you can get to pronounce latin any way you want to <laughs> they're all dead right the sine qua non without which none of of exercise and it's not if there is a sine qua non sine qua non how are you going to say it of exercise it's strength training and the sooner you get this through your thick fucking skulls the better off you're going to be okay so, hey guys catch up man strength training is where it's at running is so 1980s Running is 80s. It's not It's not 20s like we're in right now. And, you know, here's another, here's another thing to keep in mind. There's not really any better place to dump a bunch of stress than a barbell. It saved lots of our lives. Over the years, people who've been under psychological stress, have been put in shitty situations, have managed that psychological stress with the physical release provided by a heavy set of five squats. The, and I, I wrote an article recently about this, um, the stress that you experience from a psychological stress is experienced physically. It keeps you up at night. It jacks up your cortisol secretion. It does all kinds of horrible things that increase inflammation. And strength training is a wonderful place to put that psychological tension. It saved a lot of our lives. And this has probably been the most stressful year that everybody listening to this podcast has experienced. Barring some unforeseen personal stuff that's happened bad to you that didn't have anything to do with the year 2020. Uh, in general, this has been a very, very stressful six or seven month period for most of the population of the planet. Barbells are a real good place to throw all of that stress and they'll help if you'll let them running doesn't work that way running helps a little bit but a pr set of five makes you forget all of that shit for just a little while and it's a real good thing for you to do for yourself i'll leave anything out gentlemen it. well then let's get the hell out of here and let these people Go eat lunch, shall we? Thank you for joining us today on Starting Strength Radio. Next time. <laughs>